I'm Katie, as I've been introduced. I'll be serving long term with Liebensal Mission in Malawi. It's in Southeast Africa and neighbored by <coughs> Mozambique, Zambia, and Tanzania. So it's about two countries south of Kenya and two countries north of South Africa, if that gives you an idea of where it's located. I'm going to be serving as the team administrator, so I'll be doing the bookkeeping, any government runs, like sitting in their offices to apply for visas or permits or anything like that, and shopping trips for the missionaries who are working in villages when they're doing construction and that sort of thing. Um, once I've learned the local language, I'll also be doing teacher trainings at a school that we run. I'm hoping to leave in January as I'm needed there to learn the job because the guy that's currently doing my role is leaving in June. So I need to start learning it. Um, so I'm currently fundraising. I'm looking for annual and monthly supporters. And I'm so thankful. Um, praise God, in the last two months, my support has gone from 30% to 85%. Mm. So God is really working miracles. <laughs> that's a lot faster than it takes most missionaries to fundraise. So I'm really thankful. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and um, how I ended up in Malawi. So that's my family. Uh, my dad's German and my mom's Canadian, and those are my three brothers. Um, so I have both citizenships, and when I was growing up, we spent time in both countries. And at 16, I went on a short-term missions trip to Rwanda with my mom and some people from our church and fell in love with Africa felt that God was calling me to be a missionary in Africa. Wasn't sure how that was gonna look, so when I finished high school, I went back to Germany and studied at a Bible school there, a torchbearer school for a year. And then I came back to Canada, <coughs> went to the University of Waterloo and studied international development. And that program's really neat because in the fourth year, you do an eight month placement. So I actually was placed in a refugee camp in Malawi for eight months. And I got to work with this lovely group of ladies. They're vulnerable women that were <coughs> identified by the organi organization I was working for um, as needing help to support their families. So they got them together and taught them, had some of the ladies knew how to do the traditional weaving crafts from their homeland. So they learned how to do that. And then we would sell it at different craft stores and markets in the cities. Um, refugees aren't allowed to leave the camp or look for work outside the camp, so it's really difficult for them to survive. And single moms, it's even harder. Um, so it was a really powerful way to change their lives. I also got to work in the primary school to set up a special needs classroom, and those are some of the students in the classroom. Um, that didn't exist beforehand. I just sort of got assigned. You get to start the special needs classroom, go to it. Had no training in it, but it is my dream job, so I was very, very happy to do it. It's a difficult job, particularly because children with special needs in rural Africa are seen as, often seen as a curse or something that you shouldn't admit to having, <laughs> so they're hidden away. So you actually have to have somebody in the know to find these kids. So I had an assistant who had a club foot and was therefore consider considered special needs by the culture and he knew which families had children with special needs and he would take me to their houses and we talked to them about sending them to school. That wasn't very convincing until we decided that we'd feed them a meal every day and then we suddenly had students. <laughs> so over those eight months that I got to work in the refugee camp, I just fell in love with Malawi. Um, I had a really good community, friend group, church, and just felt God's call to stay there. So I got connected with a Christian international school in the capital city, and they asked me to be a kindergarten teacher there. Um, so I came home to Canada, and in a period of eight weeks, I did final presentations for my bachelor's, graduated, got taken on by Leave and Sell Canada as a short-term missionary, fundraised, moved back to Malawi and set up my classroom. Wow. It was a rush, but I did it. <laughs> well, God did it. I would not have been able to do it without him. Um, that was pretty much an impossible timeline. Um, so Liebensal Canada agreed to send me as a short-term missionary and I served at the school for a year and a half um, <coughs> teaching kindergarten. So my class had about 20 children, five-year-olds. They represented 11 different countries and it's one of the two best schools in the city, so we had a lot of influence and a lot of influential families going to the school. Um, the other kindergarten class across the hall 
had the vice president's daughter in it. Mm -hmm. So it was really neat because a lot of those families included children from families who work for the UN or for different um, embassies or for the government, mm -hmm. some of whom were non-believers or Muslims, but this is one of the best schools, so they sent their kids to us. So I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Liebensel because that's who I'm serving with now. Um, it was originally the German branch of uh, the China Inland mis Mission that was founded by Hudson Taylor. And they ended up splitting off and renaming themselves Liebensel and spreading out throughout the world, not just China. So today, Liebensel has 240 missionaries worldwide. This is a poster with some of their pictures, if you want to take a look at it afterwards. And they're working in 26 different countries. And there's lots of diff different work that they do. Um, everything from running <coughs> schools to healthcare to um, Bible training for pastors. Lots of different areas that people serve in. Um, in Malawi, there's currently four areas of work. You can see the dots on the map. That's where we're working. Um, Zomba is where the administrative headquarters are. It's one of the four cities. There's a new restaurant opened, the second in the city this past year. So I'm excited to go experience that. <laughs> um, and so that's the administrative headquarters. The one that's close to the lake is uh, radio ministry, done in the local language. And the other two are um, a village development project and um, a pastor training center. I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, this is a portion of the current Malawi team. There are currently six more missionaries that have joined the team. Uh, and I can't wait to join them and assist them. I'll be, yeah. So I'll be based at the admin site, but because I'm doing runs to the other projects to take them stuff, I'll be getting to see all of these missionaries pretty frequently. And then once I've learned the language, I'll be doing teacher trainings at the school project. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about hope today. And Malawi is not the place where you would expect to find hope. It's been <coughs> rated the poorest nation in the world twice in the last three years. 50% of the population are under 18, and only 3% are over 65. Many children and adults have died from malnutrition, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. The minimum daily wage, as I said earlier, is a one US dollar per day. But as most Malawians are subsistence farmers, growing just what their family needs and a little bit more to sell at market, they, their income is about a third of that. The past few years have been marked by alternating floods and droughts that have decimated the crops and any savings families might have had. And although primary education is free, uniforms and school supplies cost more than most families can afford. Statistics say that 69% of the country is Christian and 26% of the country is Muslim. But most, Muslims are also, uh, most Malawians are also animists and still practice their tribal beliefs alongside with those religions. But Malawi is also a place of unexpected joy. It's called the warm heart of Africa and rightfully so. The landscape is breathtakingly beautiful as are the people. Malawians are welcoming and friendly, kind and inviting and the nine tribes that live there have lived in peace for hundreds of years. When you visit, there's singing and dancing, and they'll share the best that they have with you. The wildlife in Malawi is also stunning. That's a chameleon that was in my garden one morning. Um, geckos, lizards, monkeys, tortoises, hedgehogs, and chameleons are pretty average things to see every day. But then there's, in the national parks, hippos and elephants and crocodiles and a few rhinos and big cats that you're not going to see, but they do exist. Um, and then there's Lake Malawi. It's the eighth largest lake in the world, and it's teeming with life. There's um, a specific kind of fish called the cichlid, which is prized by aquarium owners. There's over 700 species of that fish in the lake. So it's a country that, by statistics alone, seems a sad and desperate place, but it's actually full of joy and hope despite all the difficulties. Today, I'd like to share a little bit with you about the hope that's found in Christ because of the great value that God places on each of our lives. We'll soon be in the Advent season. It starts tomorrow. And it's a time of waiting for the Lord to come and rescue us. 
Jesus came to earth as a man because of how valuable we are to him. And God loves us so much that he sent us hope in flesh. Let me tell you a little bit about how I've experienced that hope at work in my life. In February 2016, I was teaching in Malawi, and after a very stressful time at the workplace, I became ill and ended up having to return to Canada to recuperate. I thought for sure that I'd be back in Malawi serving by August. But instead, my health continued to fail, and in the midsummer, I was diagnosed with a thyroid condition, a lifelong autoimmune illness that I have to take daily medication for. The past year and a half have been about waiting and waiting and waiting. <laughs> Not exactly how I thought my life was gonna go. As I waited for the diagnosis, it took six months, and then for the medication to take effect and be at the correct dosage, which took over a year, I cried out to God and asked why, when, and how. I couldn't see the purpose of this or the way out, the way back to Malawi, and I wondered if I'd ever be able to return to the country that had stolen my heart. I was worried I'd never have my useful skills back or be able to work again. Um, but Micah 7.7 7 says, As for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God my Savior. My God will hear me. And over the past year, God has taught me so much. He's had his hand in the whole thing. Among other things, if I hadn't been in Canada over the last year and a half, I would only have met my three new sisters-in-law at their weddings. <laughs> Instead, I've been able to be here and watch them in their relationships with my brothers, watch <coughs> those develop, and become friends with them myself. This was at my middle brother's wedding in October. The next one's getting married in December, and the third one's getting married in April. <laughs> <laughs> I was also able to take more training for my field work through Liebensel. This is the group of Liebensel mission candidates from this past year, and also with other mission organizations. And I was able to meet people with hearts from Malawi and that area of the world um, who I'll soon be working with on the field. This past year of mission candidates, almost the entirety of them are either serving in Malawi or Zambia right now. So they're my neighbors and I get to work with them. So it was really neat to spend a year learning with them because now I'll get to go work with them. God rebuilt my heart and soul from their utter exhaustion through my family, my missionary care team, my home church and the people around me. Um, I realized what a huge community supports and prays for me every day. And it's so powerful to see God at work through his body like that. My God, our God, did hear me, and he sent his people to help show me hope. Matthew 12, 21 says, in his name, the nations will put their hope. So I'd like to also share some stories of hope from Malawi. Part of the Malawi Leave and Sell team work at the Chisomo Project. This is a pastoral training center and it's located in a rural village, and in the mornings, the pastors go to class, and they learn how to study their Bible, how to read if they don't already know, um, how to teach from their Bible and prepare sermons, how to pastor a congregation, and then in the afternoons, they go to the wood shop, and they learn how to first build their tools out of stuff that they can get in the villages, and then how to create different things so that they can support their families through carpentry. Every year, there's another group of men and women who are sent back out to their home villages who have been trained how to pastor, how to serve their families and their villages, and they're able to support their families now while pastoring, which is almost impossible to do in the villages because you just can't make enough money from pastoring to support your family. So they no longer have to wonder how they're going to feed their children. It's pretty powerful. The second large leave and sell center in Malawi is a Buenzi. It's a village development project. And here hope is found in the feeding programs that are for children from birth through wherever we're at in our school. <laughs> Anybody that comes to the school during the day gets a hot meal. They also have begun a youth group in the village and it keeps the youth engaged. Um, a lot of villages have problems with their youth having teen pregnancies or getting into alcohol very young because they just get bored. 
Um, so we are able to keep them engaged through the youth group. And the elders of this Muslim village actually invited Liebensel in to start a Christian school because there wasn't a school nearby. The closest school was over an hour's walk away, which meant that the children in the village didn't start attending school until they were around 10 years old, which meant that they were graduating elementary school when they should be graduating from high school, which in turn led to them just dropping out of school at that age and working <coughs> to support their families. So by having the school in the village, it has completely changed the lives of these children because they can start attending school at age three. They go to the preschool at age three. They start learning the national language in the class because they're from a different tribe, so they have a different language that they've learned at home. And then once they start kindergarten, they start learning English. And right now, our school is testing two grade levels above the other government schools in the area, which means that when our kids get to high school level, they're going to be getting government scholarships to go to the really good high schools in the country. So in one generation, this whole village is going to change. And because it's a Christian school, these kids are all learning about Jesus. One of the ladies on this picture is Donatira. This is the group of ladies that I worked with in the refugee camp. Donatira is from Burundi and there was conflict there and she and her husband fled with her. They are two children. They were headed for South Africa, which is the country of hope for people in Africa. That's where they think that they're going to have an American style life. It's the country where you can change your whole life. But along the way, her husband was murdered. So she ended up reaching the refugee camp in Malawi and staying there. And she had no skills with which to earn an income to support her kids. So her only way that she could figure out to feed her children every day was to prostitute herself. And over the following years, she ended up having three more children. And with five children as a single mother, she once again couldn't feed her kids, no matter what she did. She was identified by the organization I worked with as being a vulnerable <coughs> woman that needed some help and was invited to join the crafting group. She's now able to feed her kids every day, to buy them school uniforms and supplies and send them to school. And she told me so excitedly that God carried her through her trials and has given her this opportunity and she's so grateful. The last story I'd like to share today with you is about a little boy I met in the refugee camp. His name is Jambo, and he has cerebral palsy. He was about eight or nine when I met him, and unlike most children with special needs in Malawi, his parents didn't hide him away. They're Christians, and they saw his value, just like Jesus does. So rather than locking him up in the house, they took him with them throughout the entire camp. Everybody in the camp got to know him because he's just so outgoing and joyful. And you have no idea what he's trying to tell you. It's really hard to understand him. But he would talk to you for ages with a big grin and then give you a hug. And so he was one of our first students in our classroom because his parents knew the value of education and the value of their child. And he helped the other kids in our class start to feel at home in the class and feel like they had a place. But the most exciting thing for me was to watch him learn to communicate with others. He started learning sign language from the teachers. And suddenly his eyes lit up and he realized just what he could do with this and that he'd be able to talk with his parents and other people in the camp. And just that was so amazing to see just that realization of what this was going to do for him. He has changed the face of special needs in the refugee camp and the other parents have come to realize that their kids are worth sending to school and worth investing in and that's an amazing thing. His hope and joy are miles above any other and I believe it's because he knows Jesus and he knows just how valuable he is. But this isn't just about missions or Advent. It's about <coughs> your relationship with God, my relationship with God. 
God gives unimaginable hope and value to a little disabled boy in a refugee camp, to a former prostitute trying to keep her children fed, to Muslim elders who are just trying to ensure that their children have an education, to pastors who don't have training but have a heart for God. And there's unimaginable hope and value held for you too. Romans 15, 12 says, and again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will have hope. Jesus came for you. It's easy to get tied up in knots, putting stock in our abilities, our knowledge, our belongings, our job, our worth to other people. And the coming Christmas season can be overwhelming in all the things that we think we need to do. So my challenge for you this week is to find some time to sit and ponder. If all that you have, all that you identify yourself with, was stripped away, when you think that you have no value per perceivable to someone else, God still finds you worthy of his son's life. And we get to celebrate the arrival of that hope, the fulfillment of God's promise to fix our mess over the next month. I pray that you'll treasure that hope and share it with others as you go about your days. It's a powerful thing. I'd like to close with this verse. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for listening to me and letting me share. I'm really thankful that I get the opportunity to share about God's work in Malawi. Father God, we, uh, we thank you for Katie. We thank you that uh, you're very real and present in her life and that you've shown yourself uh, mighty and strong, that you've healed her, you've called her, and you have provided for her, and you're a God who uh, is involved. Father, it's an incredible privilege incredible joy uh, to be named by your name yes. to be adopted into your family mm. and to know what it is to live by faith entrusting oneself to you thank you Lord for the grace the rescuing grace that has saved Katie and brought her into a wonderful kingdom a kingdom of love and of light mm. a kingdom of your dear son yes in whom reigns. Father, we, we just pray that, uh, Lord, as you rule and reign in Katie's life, that you would minister, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, yes. that you would empower and enable her to do the marvelous work of the gospel. Yes. And that, Lord, the evangel of uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, that, uh, Lord, that she would be able to share this incredible news of, of hope mm. and of peace in a nation that surely needs to hear this message. And uh, Lord, to have hearts that are awakened to your glory and to the wonder, Lord, of, of knowing you. The mystery, Father, that comes with uh, embracing uh, your spirit. <coughs> May indeed, Lord, uh, you minister through Katie and bless her in the years to come. May you grant her health and strength. Yes, Lord. Uh, may indeed, Lord, the joy of, uh, of serving you always fill her heart. May her life, Lord, uh, um, be filled with prayer and the gladness, Lord, of a new song every day. Yes. That your, your mercy and your compassion would be new every morning. Yes, Lord. Uh, Father, I just uh, thank you, Father, that you have called her to this wonderful and and unique calling to these people in Malawi. Mm. Bless her, Father, and it's already been prayed. May, may you go before her, may you go behind her. Yes. May you always, may you surround her with your love. Yes. We pray this in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. 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 And Lord, you have begun a good work in KD. Yes. We know you will finish this work mm. to your honor and to your glory. The Lord bless you and keep you. God make his face to shine upon you. Yes. And God be gracious Amen. unto you. Mm. God give you his peace, his presence, his power to minister for the glory of God. In his name, in Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen.